Why were various religious orders clamoring for the suppression of the Jesuits in the 17th century? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello, this is Elizabeth, and welcome to Footnoting History. This morning, we will be discussing how the Jesuits got themselves into trouble while acting as missionaries in China. The Jesuits were founded in 1534 by Ignatius Loyola and six of his friends while they were studying at the University of Paris. Because, I mean, come on, isn't that what everyone does at college? Start a new religious order? Well, that's what these rabble-rousers did. As most of the men were Spanish, they referred to their little group, which meant at a crypt under Saint-Denis, because, again, wouldn't you have your religious order meet in a crypt under Saint-Denis? So they referred to themselves as Amigos and El Señor, or Friends of the Lord. Within a few years, they had convinced the Pope to officially recognize them. The members of the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits as they became known, focused on preaching, educating, and evangelizing. The Pope, though, didn't give them his approval because Ignatius and company were smooth talkers, although that helped. They had much greater reasons. You see, Protestantism had much Europe in its grip, but the Church was ready to fight back, and the Jesuits were created to lead the charge. Five years after the confirmation of the Order's official status, the Council of Trent convened and thus began the Catholic, or Counter-Reformation, of which the Pope believed the Jesuits would stand as his forefront. So how did the Jesuits go from the Pope's, quote, elite troops in the mid-16th century to suppressed in the late 18th century? Well, some of their more unorthodox methods, as well as intra-order jealousy, are the culprits. The Jesuits believed that it was not only necessary to retake Europe from the Protestants, but also to convert peoples throughout the world, including in Asia and the Americas, before the Protestant reformers could get their hands on them. As such, the Jesuits focused on missionary work. Quickly, they expanded throughout Japan, India, and North America. Their efforts in Nouvelle France and North America were characterized by failures, such as the death of several Indian seminary students from contagious diseases brought over from Europe, but also successes, many due to the Jesuits' willingness to embrace the American Indian beliefs and customs. Jesuits learned native languages and taught that the more mystical or ritualistic aspects of Catholicism including the cult or worship of saints' relics, were similar to native rites. This approach was not an aberration, but actually one of their main methods of missionary work and conversion. For over a century, they had done much the same in China, where their efforts helped create communication lines for important innovations that shaped the scientific revolution and our lives as we know it. But this podcast isn't about cross-cultural transmission of knowledge. It's about how the Jesuits got themselves in trouble. Europeans had been traveling to China off and on during the Middle Ages, but with the ascent of the Ming Dynasty in 1368, it was more off than on as the rulers were distrustful of outsiders. European explorers continued to come, but they were restricted to where they could go and how long they could stay. The journey was extremely perilous, but at the beginning of the 16th century, a maritime route was developed and replaced the more treacherous overland route that explorers and merchants had been using for centuries. By the mid-16th century, the Portuguese were allowed to build a semi-permanent settlement on the Chinese mainland, and it's here that the first Jesuits of China came and settled. Unfortunately, their efforts were largely unsuccessful for the simple reason that none of them knew Chinese, and seemingly none of them were interested in doing so. Fifteen years after their arrival in Macau, the Portuguese settlement in China, an administrator from the home office, if you will, arrived and realized that this Jesuit mission was doomed to fail unless they learned the language. To rectify this seemingly large oversight, two Italians were sent to learn it. It would be one of the Italians, Matteo Ricci's policy of accommodation, which would lead to trouble for the Jesuits not only in China, but throughout the world. Ricci believed the way to the Chinese heart was via the educated classes and their love of Confucius, a philosopher who had been dead for 2,000 years, but whose ideas still shaped and guided the Chinese government. Confucianism taught that people should focus on their family and how to care for them as opposed to worshipping gods and worrying about the afterlife. Confucius believed that the government should be run like a meritocracy and that people should be promoted on ability, not family connections. 
While the lower classes in China were Buddhists and Taoists, the upper classes, those that comprised the government and could send their children to school where they learned information necessary for the civil exams and advancement, they were staunch Confucianists. There was an initial squabble between Ricci and another Jesuit over whether they should try to spread the good news to the upper or lower classes first, but Ricci mostly won out, or at least his results are more widely known or attributed to him. Both men agreed that the messages of Christianity needed to be shaped to a Chinese worldview. By the time Ricci passed away in 1610, which was 30 years after he set out to learn Chinese, there were 2,000 converts in China. Following his death, the Jesuits continued to be about blending in and presenting the Catholic religion as one already familiar to the Chinese. The Jesuits dressed in the robe of the Chinese literati and were even allowed to say the Mass in Chinese while the rest of the Catholic world were still required to use the Latin Mass. A general directive sent from the Society for the Propagation of Faith in 1659 states that, quote, Do not act with zeal. Do not put forward any arguments to convince these people to change their rights, their customs, or their usages except if they are evidently contrary to the Catholic religion and morality. What would be more absurd than to bring France, Spain, Italy, or any other European country to the Chinese, but instead bring to them the faith, a faith that does not reject or hurt the rights, nor the usages of any people, provided that they are not distasteful, but instead keeps and protects them. Basically, the Society for the Propagation of the Faith said, Let them be. A dynastic change from the Ming to the Manchu emperors caused friction for the Jesuit missionaries in the mid-17th century, but for the most part, travels between China and Europe continued, there were more converts, and Chinese Christians even traveled to Europe. All right, so what's the problem, you might ask? Ricci's policy of accommodation, as it would known, had a peace which proved to be the sticking point for other missionaries. The Jesuits participated in and allowed converts to continue to practice Chinese rites. Chinese rites were parts of Confucianism, and they included rituals carried out at home to honor ancestors, as well as rituals carried out by the government to reinforce the power and wonder of the imperial state. The Jesuits argued that these rituals were secular and were not actually religious, nor in conflict with Catholicism. From the viewpoint of the Chinese, this decision to incorporate traditional beliefs into Catholicism was successful. Emperor Kangxi didn't feel the need to convert strongly enough to actually do so, but he did issue an edict in 1692 that the Catholic missionaries and their religion were fine, acceptable, and even helpful. The religion was given the same state approval as Buddhism and Taoism. So the Jesuits continued to make headway in converting the Chinese to Catholicism. The Chinese government was fine with the Jesuits doing so and even had members of the order serve in official capacities at the royal court. Everything was hunky-dory, right? Wrong. Intra-order jealousy was about to shake things up. The Jesuits were not the only missionary orders of the Catholic Church. Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians were monastic missionary groups also serving in China, except they refused to adopt any of the local customs. Shocked by the behavior of the Jesuits, and perhaps a little put out at their successes, leaders of these three groups wrote letters to the Pope in which they outlined three points. First, the Jesuits were allowing the Chinese to use a different term for God than had been agreed on. Second, the Jesuits were allowing the Chinese converts to take part in governmental rituals praising Confucius. And finally, the Jesuits were allowing the converts to continue their ancestor worship. As an aside, and I admit that my knowledge of ancestor worship is not specific, but I do find it interesting that Catholics believe in the communion of saints and other dearly departed to whom they can ask to intercede on their behalf with God, but somehow the Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians couldn't modify ancestor worship to fit this already pre-existing Catholic belief? All right, fine, they couldn't or they didn't. And to return to our actual topic, the Jesuits argued that there were government rituals and were in no way religious or a problem with Catholicism. The Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians didn't agree, and unfortunately, neither did multiple popes. Between 1704 and 1742, various papal decrees were released. These decrees stated in no uncertain terms that the practice of Chinese rites was not allowed for Catholic converts. As much as the popes didn't agree with the policy of accommodation, the Chinese emperors were even less impressed by the pontiff's statement. In fact, if a document can be said to convey an eye roll, then the Kangxi emperor's response in 1721 assuredly does so. So let's just give you the whole thing. Quote, I have concluded that the Westerners are petty indeed. It is impossible to reason with them because they do not understand larger issues as we understand them in China. 
There is not a single Westerner versed in Chinese works, and their remarks are often incredible and ridiculous. To judge from this proclamation from the Pope, their religion is no different from other small, bigoted sects of Buddhism or Taoism. I have never seen a document which contains so much nonsense. From now on, Westerners should not be allowed to preach in China to avoid further trouble. Unfortunately for the converts, the Chinese government not only banned Westerners, but began to persecute Christians. After finding their welcome in China revoked, the Jesuits continued to burn bridges throughout European countries until, by the 1770s, they had been expelled from Brazil, Portugal, France, Spain, and Parma. While political reasons were behind these removals, the final blow came in 1773, when Pope Benedict XIV officially suppressed or banned the order. What charges did he list in his papal brief? Within the 45-paragraph document known as the Dominus Acredemptor, the charges include the Jesuits, quote, practice of certain idolatrous ceremonies, namely their policy of accommodation and willingness to engage in the rituals of the people they were ministering to. To make sure that no one missed the point, Benedict stated that, quote, we do, out of our certain knowledge and the fullness of our apostolic power, suppress and abolish the said company. We deprive it of all activity whatever, and in short, every other place whatsoever, in whatever kingdom or province they may be situated, we abrogate and annul its statutes, rules, customs, decrees, and constitutions, even though confirmed by oath and approved by the Holy See or otherwise. In like manner, we annul all and every privilege, indult, general, or particular. We declare all and all kind of authority, the general, the provincials, the visitors, and other superiors of the said society, to be forever annulled and extinguished. End quote. Yeah, he wasn't playing around. In just over two centuries, the Jesuits had gone from the defenders of the faith to public enemy number one. Members of the order lived out their days in Russia and Prussia, as the Roman Catholic Church had little power there. Within two generations, the Jesuits were restored to their rightful place in the Catholic hierarchy, but it wouldn't be until the 20th century that Matteo Ricci's policy of accommodation was vindicated and found support in the upper levels of the church. All right, guys, that's the official story. But now I'm going to throw out a conspiracy theory that's been making the rounds, most famously in Lionel Jensen's 1997 award-winning work, Manufacturing Confucianism. Here it is, what if the Jesuits invented Confucius? What if the Jesuits took the sayings of a man known as Kong Zi, sayings which had made up only a portion of the Chinese spiritual system known as Ru, and then edited them and their author to create a new tradition in which a sage known as Confucius had existed, a man that they could liken in his philosophic abilities to the Jesus figure the Jesuits were trying to sell to the Chinese? Remember Ricci's plan to adopt Catholicism to Confucianism? What if, in reality, he was constructing an entirely new tradition for the Chinese, one that became embraced by European Enlightenment scholars and strongly identified with Chinese history? In this podcast, we've discussed how the Jesuits got themselves into trouble because they were seen as accommodating converts to the point that their religious mission was obscured. What if the larger story is that within a few strokes of his pen, Matteo Ricci dramatically changed the history of China? This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast. You can also like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Join us next week when we'll be talking about popular unrest in late antique Ravenna. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.